Hi, today we're going to take a look at the building blocks of life. So our objectives are, um, we're going to describe the role of carbon in living things. We're going to describe how polymers are formed and broken down. And we're going to summarize the um, four major families of biological molecules in terms of their structure. So how are they built? and what their functions are, and then we're going to compare the structure and function of each biological molecule. So chemistry of carbon. Um, carbon, as you know, has four electrons in its valence electron shell. So we've got four valence electrons that carbon has, and as a result of it having four valence electrons, um, carbon can form um, covalent bonds very readily with other atoms. So that means that we can get an endless amount of diversity in terms of the carbon structures that we can form. So carbon can form uh, straight chains, they can form branch chains, carbon can form rings, um, carbon can also form single, double, or triple bonds. Carbon is very unique in the variety of bonds that it can form, not only with itself, but with other atoms, and the fact that it can also form single, double, and triple bonds. And this is because carbon has four valence electrons in its outermost energy level. So the reason why we're referred to as carbon-based life forms is because all of our biological molecules, their backbone is that of carbon. And why is their backbone carbon? Because carbon has four valence electrons and can form the wide variety of bonds and shapes that we see here. So let's get into our macromolecules. Macro means big and molecules means just the things that are bringing, um, building them together. So we're looking at large molecules, so macromolecules. And there are four macromolecules. We know them as carbid, uh, carbohydrates, lipids, or fats proteins, and nucleic acids. So carbon atoms can be joined to form carbon molecules. And our macromolecules are carbon-based molecules, so are pretty much most other molecules. So large compounds can be made um, by joining smaller compounds together. So our macromolecules are made by joining smaller compounds together to make our large macromolecules. So monomers are the small compounds, those are our building blocks, and polymers are the molecules that are made up from repeating units of identical or nearly identical compounds. So those are the monomers. So monomers are linked together to form polymers. So if you think about a puzzle, you've got your individual puzzle pieces. Okay, your individual puzzle pieces are your monomers, but once you link them all together and fit them all together, you get your polymer, which is your completed puzzle, and you can see the picture and the shape of what it's supposed to make. So macromolecules are large molecules formed by joining smaller organic um, molecules together. So we're going to find out that each macromolecule, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, have um, are built by using monomers, these smaller subunits, in order to make our larger macromolecule. So the making of polymers. So how do we end up making a polymer? So we make a polymer through a reaction called a condensation reaction. It's also referred to as dehydration synthesis. Either way, you're going to be losing water in order to build a larger molecule. So linking monomers together to form complex polymers. So water um, is removed when joining monomers together. Um, this is an anabolic um, reaction, which means it requires energy in order to um, actually build something, which makes sense because if you think of like a Lego set or if you're building a car or if you're making a cake, you actually are mixing things together and using energy in order to do this. So when you're making polymers, you're going to be using energy. Um, and this is called a condensation reaction. So if you think of condensation, you think of water. You know, the condensation or the water droplets on the outside of your glass in the summer. Or dehydration. Dehydration means you don't have or you're losing water. So we can see here we've got our um, short polymer right here. We've got our larger or smaller monomer, unlinked monomer over here. We've got hydrogen um, 
atom there, an OH or a hydroxyl group here, and those two end up pairing up together in order to form a bond, and we've got the loss of water, so that's our dehydration uh, synthesis or our condensation reaction. So how do we break down polymers? Well, we break down polymers using hydrolysis. The prefix hydro means water, so H2O. And the suffix lysis means to break. So literally this whole word means water breaking or to break using water. So hydrolysis is when you take a polymer, we add water um, to the bond, and you end up breaking, um, breaking down polymers. So um, it's a catabolic reaction, which means it releases energy. So if you think about our digestive process, okay, our um, bodies, our digestive system, is our breaking down polymers into smaller monomorph monomer forms so that those monomers can be sent around and into cells so they can be converted into energy, which is pretty nice. Uh, this is one of the reasons why water is very, very important and why you can only last so long without water because water is needed in order to break these large polymers down. And if we can't break these large polymers down, we're not getting that release of energy that we need. So we're going to take a closer look at each of the four macromolecules. So these are the four macromolecules necessary for life. Carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. You need to know that lipid refers to fats. I'm no longer going to be saying fat. I'm only going to be referring to lipids. So let's take a look at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. And they're found in a specific ratio. So for every one carbon, we're going to find that there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So carbohydrates are in a very specific ratio of one to two to one, carbon, hydrogen to oxygen. Um, the monomer of a carbohydrate is referred to as a monosaccharide. So the prefix mono means one, and the suffix saccharide actually means sweet, so we have one sweet. Um, some examples of um, monosaccharides are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Fructose is found in fruits. Galactose is actually found in milk. And how do we know it's a sugar? If we take a look at the suffix, OSE, we'll find that any time we have something ending in OSE, it's going to refer to a carbohydrate. So that's just something that you should remember, that any time you have the suffix OSE, we're dealing with a carbohydrate. So glucose, fructose, and galactose actually end up, um, can join together um, with each other and in a variety of different combinations in order to form our polymer form, which is referred to as a polysaccharide. Now there are two different, or there's three different types of polysaccharides depending on what organisms we're looking at. So if we're looking at plants, um, we have the polysaccharide starch. So if you think of any of your root vegetables, potatoes, carrots, beets, those are going to have starch. And then cellulose is the cell wall material um, found in plants. Animals have a um, polysaccharide um, form in the form of glycogen. So the body actually stores um, glycogen in the liver and in the muscle tissue. Um, so before carbohydrates actually get converted into fat, they actually get stored as glycogen first, and then your body will tap into those glycogen stores in the muscle and in the liver, and then if glycogen is around for too long, then it will ultimately get converted into fat. The function of carbohydrates um, is that they are the main source of energy for um, our bodies, and it also provides structural material in terms of cellulose being the... Um, material of the cell wall uh, for plants. And where can we find our carbohydrates? We can find them in bread, we can find them in pasta, rice, whole grains. Um, so there you go. And again, if you have an O's ending, that means you're dealing with sugar, which means you're dealing with a carbohydrate. So monosaccharides, so each monomer is a sugar. So here's an example of a monosaccharide. Uh, this um, uh, hexagon right there, 
and these three hexagons being um, linked together form a polysaccharide. So a monosaccharide is um, each monomer is a sugar, and when the body um, needs energy, the carbohydrate is broken down into these individual sugar molecules, and these sugar molecules are then converted into cellular energy as ATP. So some other examples of carbohydrates, we've got disaccharides, and the prefix di means two. So these are two monosaccharides joined together to form a double sugar, and we form disaccharides through a condensation reaction or dehydration synthesis. And our examples of disaccharides are sucrose, lactose, and maltose. So um, sucrose you find as like um, your simple like table sugars and stuff like that. When you go to like the coffee shop, you can find sucrose. Lactose is your milk sugar, so what you find in milk. And then maltose is um, typically found in Whoppers. If you actually end up eating the candy Whoppers, um, maltose has a very distinct flavor. Um, if you ask your parents about like malted milkshakes, um, they're made using maltose. And then our polysaccharides are made up of three or more monosaccharides. So our examples are starch. Um, this is a way for plants to store excess sugar. Um, it's made up of hundreds of glucose molecules. Cellulose, it's found only in plants and it gives strength and rigidity to plants so it provides um, the material of the cell wall um, and sort of acts like a makeshift skeleton for plants. And glycogen, as, we, as I talked about before, um, animals store excess sugar in liver and muscles and it's made up of hundreds of thousands of glucose molecules. So some examples of polysaccharides, we've got our starches here. We've got glycogen um, granules in muscle tissues, so there you go. And then we've got cellulose, which is made up of the plant cell wall material and what paper is made up of. So your paper that you're writing down your notes on um, is made up of cellulose, so long uh, polysaccharide chains. So our next uh, macromolecule is lipids, and lipids are made up mostly of carbon and hydrogen. We've got some oxygen in there, but they're mostly um, long chains of both carbon and hydrogen. Um, the monomer form of a lipid is a glycerol and fatty acid chains to make up what we refer to as, whoops, as a tri, tri, glyceride. Okay. Um, remember that there are two types of fats. We've got unsaturated fats, which are liquid at room temperature. Those are our plant fats. And then saturated fats, which are solid at room temperature, which are our animal fats. Um, some examples of fats are just, you know, either your oils, your animal fats, waxes. Uh, there's a whole wide variety of functions for lipids. So, they provide long-term energy storage. So as we talked about when we talked about nutrition, we know that they store more energy per gram than carbohydrates because they're such, a lar they're such large and big molecules. They're found in biological membranes. They're used as chemical messengers. So this is our hormones. Our hormones of estrogen. and testosterone. And then they're also designed to insulate and protect and cushion our organs. So um, saturated versus unsaturated lipids. So this is an example over here. This diagram is an example of a triglyceride. So this is an example of a triglyceride. Um, this is a glycerol up here. This is our glycerol. And then these are our fatty acid chains. And this actually represents this molecule here is showing me a unsaturated fat. And we know it's an unsaturated fat because it has a double bond in it. So we've got this kind of kink in this chain. These um, 
fatty acid chains are saturated, but overall the molecule itself is going to be unsaturated because we have at least one um, double bond here, unsaturated chain. So a saturated um, fatty acid or a saturated fat, um, the carbon atoms contain all single bonds. They're usually found in meat and dairy products and they're usually solid at room temperature. So these are your cheeses, you know, the fat alongside the steak, stuff like that, butter. Your unsaturated fats, the carbon contains at least one double bond. So here this is an unsaturated fat because we contain at least one double bond. We can also have polyunsaturated fats, which means that we contain several um, double bonds within the fatty acid chain. Um, this tends to be healthier than um, saturated fats, and those are our oils. So our sesame oil, our peanut oil, our corn oil, our olive oil, and those are all going to be liquid at room temperature. So here again is an example between a saturated fat and an unsaturated fat. Here we've got single bonds between all of our carbons. Here we've got a double bond um, between our two carbons, which is our unsaturated fat. The saturated refers to the number of hydrogens attached to the fatty acid chain. So we're calling this a saturated fat because it's saturated with hydrogen. It has a maximum number of hydrogen that it can hold, whereas this is referred to as an unsaturated fat because we have lost those hydrogen. So we don't have as many hydrogen um, atoms in our unsaturated fat as compared to our saturated fat. So some exa other examples of lipids, cholesterol is an important uh, lipid that's involved in um, the building of cells and the carrying of messages between cells. If um, you have too much cholesterol, it is a risk factor for heart disease. And then we know our hormones, estrogen and testosterone, those are formed between um, four fused carbon rings and those are used to build um, or use lipids to build them. Some other examples of lipids, phospholipids. This is a very, very important component of the cell membrane. The cell membrane is made up primarily of phospholipids. So we've got our polar head with our fatty acid tails. Um, the head is polar, meaning that it's hydrophilic and likes to attract water. Um, the fatty acid tails are nonpolar, which means that they are hydrophobic and they don't like to um, be associated with water. So these phospholipids end up forming a bilayer, so that means two layers, um, and they form that spontaneously. And these um, phospholipids are the main components of our cell membranes. And we're going to take a closer look at those and the structure of our cell membrane uh, later on this year. But it's just another example of a lipid and why it's so important, because all of our cells are made up of these phospholipids. Our next macromolecule are nucleic acids. And nucleic acids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So we've got our chinops here. Um, our monomers of a nucleic acid are referred to as nucleotides, and those nucleotides are made up of um, three components, a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Depending on um, what um, nucleic acid we're referring to, either DNA or RNA, the five carbon sugar is going to change, and some of the nitrogenous bases might change. So our polymer forms of nucleic acids are either DNA or RNA. Uh, the function of nucleic acids. Um, DNA's function is to store genetic information, whereas RNA's function is to transmit genetic information. And where are we going to find these nucleic acids? We're going to find them in all cells. So all the food that we eat, we're going to find them within the nucleus of those cells. And then here is um, the structure of uh, nucleic acid. So this is an example of DNA because it is double-stranded. And then we're taking a closer look at the monomer form, which is a nucleotide. And we can see here that a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, a five-carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, five. So it's a pentagon. So a five-carbon sugar and our nitrogenous base here. I like to think of um, nucleotides as being um, L-shaped. So you've got here, 
you're forming the L. And then if you actually hold up your fingers um, in an L shape, your tip of your fingers, your phosphate group, uh, the joint between your finger and your thumb is going to be your sugar, and then the tip of your thumb will be your base. Just an easy way to remember the structure of a nucleotide. Let's take a look at proteins. So proteins are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the monomers of um, proteins are referred to as amino acids. And amino acids, this is the structure of an amino acid. Amino acids are made up of very distinct groups. They're made up of an amino group. And how do we know it's an amino group? Because it has the um, NH2 here, so the nitrogen is right there. That's an amino group. Um, it's also made up of a carboxyl group, so the COOH, so that's um, an important group. Um, and those are on either side of that central carbon atom right here. And then we've got our basic hydrogen group, which is up here. You're always going to have a hydrogen group at the top. And then we have what we call our placeholder R group. Um, it's called an R group because it, the R is just a placeholder, just like you would use X in math as like a placeholder for like a number. Um, when we um, actually change out this R group and actually put in atoms like carbon or CH4 or whatever, we're going to actually change the amino acid. So if we take a look here, these are our 20 different amino acids. Remember that we make, um, we, we make most of our amino acids except for the eight essential amino acids. So if we take a look here, we've got all of our different amino acids. We've got our amino group here, we've got our hydrogen group there, we've got our carboxyl group here, and this is our R group. But if we replace that R with a hydrogen, we get the amino acid glycine. If we uh, replace the R with a CH3, we get the amino acid alanine. But you see here this basic structure. We've got our central carbon with our amino group, with our carboxyl group, with our hydrogen group. So as long as we change out the R group, we're going to be getting our different amino acids. And our polymer form of proteins are called polypeptides. So polypeptides are long chains of amino acids, and many different polypeptides make up a protein. So we get a long chain of amino acids, that's called a polypeptide, and you can put together many different polypeptides in order to make up a protein. So um, a dipeptide is just two amino acids joined together by what we refer to as a peptide bond. So when um, two amino acids actually link up, the bond between the two amino acids is called a peptide bond. So know that's a very unique bond when you have um, two amino acids joining up. You've got that peptide bond, which is indicated right here. Um, and how do we get the formation of a polymer? Again, we go back to um, dehydration synthesis. So we've got an amino acid here, we've got an amino acid here. We're going to lose water in that process, and we're going to get our dipeptide. And here we've got our peptide bond between the two amino acids. So amino acids make up, um, ultimately end up making polypeptides, which end up making proteins. So the number and order in which the amino acids are joined define a protein's primary structure. And then after an amino acid chain has, is formed, it folds into a unique three-dimensional shape, um, which is the protein's secondary structure, such as a helix, which is like a spiral, or a pleat. So think of like the wavy chips, like wavy type chips. Those are a pleat. So if we take a look, we've got the primary structure of a polypeptide, so we've got lyse, two lysines together, two glycines together, a leucine, a valine, an alanine, a histidine. So we've got our um, primary structure, and um, based on this primary structure, we're going to get our secondary structure. So here we've got our um, helical shape in our secondary structure, and then um, be, after that helical shape, we're going to get um, end up getting like a tertiary structure, so we're going to get some more folding that takes place. And then this polypeptide itself will join up with another polypeptide that will form a fourth structure or a quaternary structure, which will ultimately end up being our final protein or enzyme or whatever it's going to be. 
So what are the fo function of proteins? Well, they can serve many different roles. Um, they um, speed up chemical reactions in the form of enzymes. They provide structural support, as in they're the major components of bone and muscle. They provide um, transport, so they move substances into and out of cells. You can actually get rid of this word here. I'm not sure what I was trying to say, but they're responsible for moving substances into and out of cells, and we'll take a look at that when we take a look at cells in our cell membrane. And they're also used to make hormones as well. So now that we've reviewed our building blocks of life and our macromolecules, you should be able to tell me why carbon is important to living things, explain how polymers are formed and broken down, so formed using condensation reaction or dehydration synthesis and broken down using hydrolysis, and then identify the structure and functions of each group of biological mo molecules. So tell me the structure and function of carbohydrates, tell me the structure and function of lipids, tell me the structure and function of proteins, Tell me the structure and function of nucleic acids. I hope you found this helpful, and um, good luck.